Uh, well, a lot of things have changed in the last week. When we when last we left you, there was a petition to remove the sheriff of Berkeley County, Nate Harmon. Right, the Israeli uh, Palestinian conflict was uh, not yet in a ceasefire. Right, and uh, when we left you, Ryan Weld was still a candidate for attorney general in the state of West Virginia, and uh, he has decided since to drop out of that race and return to running for his seat in the Senate. He joins us via telephone right now. Ryan, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, gentlemen. Hope you all had a great Thanksgiving. We did. Uh, what time does your alarm clock go for the morning, uh, Ryan? <laughs> Let's see. I've been up since a little bit before 6 o'clock this morning. A little bit before 6. On purpose? <laughs> uh, sadly, yes. <laughs> the look at the front of it on Gil Strap's face. <laughs> oh, you did that on purpose? <laughs> That's going to give a perfect lead-in for us. What time did you get up again this morning, Rob? 3.20. 3.20. We'll hear that about four or five times, yes. John. I know. <laughs> I won't let you forget it, just in case. Uh, Ryan, uh, you made the decision to drop out of the race last week. I believe I found out about it on Wednesday of last week, uh, actually from uh, Mac Warner, uh, of all people, in fact. Uh, Can you tell me why you made that decision? Sure. Uh, So last Wednesday, I announced that I was no longer going to pursue my campaign for attorney general and instead run for re-election to the Senate and return uh, to that body. Hopefully the, the voters here in the Northern Panhandle see fit to do so and continue my work there. Uh, and, and, Rob, my decision really was about my principles and my beliefs uh, as to how to, to run a campaign and, and what public office should be about. Um, you know, a statewide race is, is a grind, and it's I've seen candidates, you know, compromise who they are or their principles for political gain and and lose sight of why they're doing this or, or, or who they are in it. And that's just not me. And, you know, when you are running for the state Senate, when you're running for the House of Delegates, a campaign like that is all about connecting with voters and getting out and, and talking with your constituents, being in, being at events and running into them at the grocery store. But it, it seems that, that a campaign, a statewide campaign, is, is more about trying to connect with donors rather than the, the people who are going to be voting for you. And, and that kind of grind, that kind of nonstop calling and, and asking for, for campaign contributions and trying to leverage relationships in order to get something out of it, that, that's just not who I am. And I have learned that over the past seven months. Over the past seven months, I have learned a lot about the state of West Virginia and my travels, but I've also learned a lot about myself. And I, I, I know that what would be required moving forward in, in order to really run a campaign like this to, to win this race, it's just not the kind of person I am. I'm not willing to make those changes or those compromises. Ryan, then in regards to the compromises, are the compromises mainly made – to appeal to those making campaign contributions, or are they mainly made to get the votes from the voters? I think oftentimes, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I had an opportunity for a couple of big donors to come into the campaign. And they would have, you know, things would have changed dramatically in terms of of our ability to, you know, to finance and be able to spend the way that we would need to. But it became clear to me that I was also going to have to change my messaging and the way that I ran the campaign and the issues that I put at the forefront or how I talked about them differently. And that just, after not sleeping for about two nights, seeing that, you know, waking up at 20 after three in the morning, like some people, I just realized (laughs) that that's not for me. And that's not why I got into this. And it's not what I think public office should be about. And so I made that decision that I wasn't going to to change who I was as a candidate or how we talked about the race in order to attract investors uh, to the campaign. And so, you know, I am absolutely comfortable with this decision. Uh, I'm I'm at ease with it. I feel better after having made it. Um, You know, if, if campaigns were just about the the parades and fairs and festivals and luncheons and coffee clubs, I would, I would love it. But unfortunately that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg of a campaign running for a statewide office. And 
again, those I think the compromises that, that would have been required or the what would have needed to be done moving forward, that's just not the kind of person that I am. About two-thirds, according to the Metro News article, of the electorate is undecided on this un, uh, attorney general race, uh, Ryan. Any concern at all that you were getting out too early while there were so many undecideds? No, because I, here, here's the thing, Rob, is that I can remain as a, as a member of the Senate, return to the Senate, and continue to represent my senatorial district. You know, I'm, the one thing that I absolutely learned is that I am at home here in the Northern Panhandle. I'm at home in Wellsburg with my wife, Alex, and our family here. And I don't need to trade that for, for a title or for a different position that's perceived to have more power in order to feel that I'm making a difference. And, and again, that's something that I truly learned about myself and learned about being in public office over the past seven months. And so it's not about getting out too early. Maybe I, I could have had the office. That's, that's not what it's about. It's, it, it's really about what I felt I would have had to have given up or compromised on moving forward in order to achieve that. And yeah. That's just, it, it wasn't for me. Bill? Yeah. Uh, good morning, Ron. Uh, I, I'm listening to the news with element of disappointment uh, both ways. You're one, it's always refreshing to talk to someone as genuine and as man of principle as what you are, especially someone that's running for public office. Uh, Thank you. But the, the flip side is I know probably the happiest person in the state uh, is going to be Craig Blair because he was seeing your potential absence along with Charlie Trump on the finance committee was going to be a massive hole to fill. Now that's going to obviously with you going back to the Senate, and and I would think you'd have a very good chance of taking Charlie's place as chair of the Finance Committee. That's going to be a great relief uh, to to Blair and also to many of us that do follow politics because you, you're you that steady hand. You're that rational hand. You're the one that's uh, – uh, uh, that's, uh, I said uh, finance. I meant judiciary. Sorry. Judiciary Committee. Uh, you're the one that kind of follows through on a rational level. So – in that regard, I'm I'm pleased to hear the news, but I'm also disappointed because I think you would have done an outstanding job as Attorney General. So, well, and, and thank you very much, sir, and I, I appreciate that. And I and I did talk to, to President Blair. You know, he and I spoke uh, Tuesday. I think it was Tuesday afternoon, maybe. Um, I obviously went to touch base with him before I made the announcement. And you know, I, I would be absolutely honored to have the. Uh, the you know, the chance to be the next judiciary chair and follow. You know, I have sat to the to the left of Charlie Trump for the past seven sessions, been his vice chair and, and learned from the master on how to operate a committee and, and how to work with people and, and getting you know things done um, in that decision. That who's going to be the chair of that committee is up to the next Senate president, who obviously I hope is, is Craig Blair, that he you know, wins his primary election this May and continues on in his role as the Senate president. And, and I look forward to, to serving with him and in whatever capacity he, you know, asked me to, to fill. Good morning, Ryan. Uh, this is John. Um, John. <clears throat> you opened a door, so I'm going to ask you to walk through it. So these donors and such that you had and the compromises that you felt that you would have to make to pursue the office, um, those are riddles at this point. What, what are we talking about here? Well, you know, some people, when they invest in campaigns or, or you know, become, a, you know, a, a big donor to a campaign, sometimes they want to see changes made to the campaign and, and maybe change the issues that are at the forefront of that candidate's platform or change how they talk about those issues. Um, you know, maybe they are, let's say that, that you're I don't know, running for, I'm just a, a hypothetical that, that you're running for attorney general and they say, you know, our biggest issue, our number one thing is I'm just using an example of something that's, you know, going on here in the Northern Panhandle, natural gas. And so they want your whole campaign to be about natural gas or your whole campaign to be about suing the federal government on one specific particular issue. And, and so in order for them to, to want to, you know, donate to you and, and bundle some other contributions they would like for, you know, those changes to be made. And maybe they want you to be more upfront on social issues. I, I, but 
that's the kind of thing that, you know, some, a lot of times that doesn't happen. Donors believe in you as a person. They believe in you as a candidate. And they want to give to you because they believe in you, no matter what issue is at the forefront of your campaign or how you're messaging those kinds of things. But sometimes people come in and say, you know, we think that you would make a, a tremendous, you know, attorney general or, or governor or secretary of state, but we would like to see you be, you know, more aggressive on this issue or play a larger role in this space. And, and you know, for me, the things that, that I was running on, those are the things that I'm comfortable on. Those are the things that, that I talk about the most, but necessarily didn't want to change how we were running the campaign in order to attract, you know, donors in the, those spaces. And so it just wasn't something that I, I wanted to, to make, you know, those compromise on. Well, the cynics among us would say that that's, that's true of every elected office. I mean, if nobody gives... <laughs> If you're going to get a large corporate donation, for example, the corporate donation is coming with the hopes that the politician at any level is going to do the, the things that will help your, the, the corporation, right? So isn't this kind of a constant throughout all politics, including the Senate? No, I've never felt that way in the Senate. You know, I've run uh, twice, 16 and, and 20, and thankfully been you know, won those campaigns, but I never felt that in, in those campaigns. Never felt that someone was saying, you know, here's a contribution, but we would like to see you be more aggressive on X, or or we would like for you to, to when you're in the Senate, to, to do this. It, because, you know, there are a lot of smaller donations, a lot of more local uh, contributions, people that you know, people that are investing in your campaign because they live within your Senate district, or you probably have known them for a very long time. And so it's, I think it's much different uh, on a legislative level uh, as opposed to, to running statewide. And you don't always know your donors. You don't always, you know, you're calling people, maybe you're, you're meeting them for lunch or maybe you're having phone calls with them. But, you, it, you know, you're never going to know all of your donors on, on a statewide level. But when you're running for a legislative race, there's a lot less financing uh, that's it, it, that it takes in order to, to run a legislative campaign. And so more often than not, you do know your, your donors, you know what they're about, and, and the issues that are important to them are issues that are important to your, your, uh, your legislative district. Uh, Ron, going back to the positions, uh, you were throwing a curveball uh, a few months ago when J.B. Mikulski decided to get in the race. Uh, there was a clear distinction between you and Mike Stewart, uh, and yet there was less clear distinction between you and J.B. Mikulski. Uh, did that have any bearing at all on your decision to pull out of the race at this time? No. My decision had nothing to do with anybody else in the race or any circumstances that were outside of just what I thought was best for me and not being feeling as if I was compromising on my principles uh, when I first got into elected office back in 2014 as a member of the House of Delegates. I, you know, sitting down and, and, and talking with my wife, you know, she's been with me the entire you know time that I've been in this campaign. We put a lot of miles on a car together. And, and so we sat down and, and, and made this decision together and really just looking at it in terms of how the race was affecting me and how it was affecting us and, and what my thoughts were on what I truly thought was the best way to continue to serve, but without having, again, to compromise on anything that, that, that I, of why I got into this in the first place. Will you take a position uh, as the race goes forward between uh, J.B. Mikulski and Mike Stewart? No, no. But, you know, there's the, the filing period ends at the end of January. There's still time for a qualified lawyer and, and candidate to get into that race. And so now I have no position okay. at this point. What did you think of Mike Stewart's statement that you and McCuskey are virtually the same on policy issues, but now the most capable one between the two has withdrawn? Uh, I, I, <laughs> Senator Stewart has never been shy about his feelings during the campaign. <laughs> <laughs> You're not running anymore. You can be a little. You can be a little more open about it than that. I guess not. All right. Uh, do you have a primary opponent in the Senate campaign then, uh, Ryan? 
Uh, no, I, I, I don't. Uh, but again, you know, the filing period ends sometime in the end of January. Uh, I can't remember the exact day. And so somebody, you know, if they want to run in this race or any other race has until then to, to file for, for an office. But at this point, I, 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 I don't know of any. What do you think will be the biggest uh, legislative challenges that the next Senate will face coming up in 2024, uh, Ryan? Um, I still think that we're going to have to, to navigate through economic development opportunities and how do we best make those work around the state and how do we continue to best you know, position West Virginia in order to continue to attract those opportunities. Obviously, we've had a few, uh, uh, well, actually more than a few, several uh, over the past, you know, year or so. And so I think that's the big thing is that how do we continue to do that? Uh, personally, for me, it's going to continue to work on substance abuse issues, uh, on, you know, veterans issues. That's Those are the things that I've you know, always been focused on as a legislator and, and what I'm going to continue to work on. Uh, Ron, let me uh, follow that line, but just a little bit more uh, toward the judiciary specifically. We have a couple of instances in the Eastern Panhandle of elected officials uh, that have been um, uh, been challenged whether they should stay in the job or not. Uh, but the process is very laborious and very long. We're talking about several, several weeks. Uh, in the case of Jefferson County, the county commission has not functioned at all. In the case of uh, Berkeley County, the sheriff has been uh, uh, proposed to be removed from office. Is there any any thought of expediting this process so that the resolution happens much sooner than what it's currently in law? Well, I think you always want to be careful, and, and I know about the, you know, the, the, the the statutory provisions to talk about removal from office. And you always want to be careful uh, when you're talking in that space, because at the end of the day, you're talking about, uh, you know, overturning the, the, the will of the voters, that the voters elected a, an individual to, to a particular office. And then you are in essence, uh, you know, for malfeasance or for criminal behavior or for, uh, you know, just the, the inability to, or the absolute lack of a follow-up to do their job, overturning that will and removing them. And so you, you always need to be careful about that. But the, I do see your point about ensuring that we have a proper procedure uh, in place and a, to, to enable us to do that, uh, to enable the, the, you know, other elected officials who have some statutory authority or the voters themselves to be able to do so. But again, we can't make it so that it's too easy and that everybody and, and anyone can file a petition and start that process. But we also can't make it so difficult that we can't ensure the government continues to, to function. And I, I don't know the specifics of the situation in the Eastern Panhandle, but if you have a, a commission where you're unable to get a quorum and the business of the people isn't being conducted for whatever reason, and I think that obviously warrants a look at you know what's going on but again the time frame involved it, you always have to take into consideration again the, the the consideration that you are overturning the, the will of the voters and, and putting those people in the office in the first place uh, i want to go back to picking the same scab about the decision to get out and being influenced <clears throat> being pushed by donors to do things that that you don't want to do um, was there a, a tipping point? I mean, you, you, it's been a long campaign so far with five, six months. It, it feels like maybe a little longer. Um, are there specific issues? Was it a matter of rep focusing on things that you don't believe in? Or was it a matter of not focusing on the things that you do? And can you be specific in that at all? Don't mention who the donors are, obviously, but get into the specifics of, of what the stakes are here. No, it's just a matter of you know, putting issues at the forefront of your campaign that you didn't particularly, that I didn't feel particularly comfortable uh, putting at the, the forefront of For why I was running to, to, to be attorney general. I don't, and and I know that you're, but I, I really don't want to get into the, the, the nuts and bolts of it because, because of the issues. I mean, that's, it's just, I just let it, be and I thought about it for a long time, and I thought about what, you know, I think 
would have been required in order to, you know, again, John, the, the biggest thing is, and that was just, that was to me a symptom of the larger thing that, you know, you spend your days, uh, you know, it, like I said, it's a grind, making calls all day. You, you're, I mean, it, the phrase they call it is dialing for dollars. And, and you're, you're calling all day and you're, you're talking to potential donors. You're, you, you know, it's one, you're chasing it one after the other. And, and you, you know, there's a constant deal making or, you know, attempts at deal making to move forward. There's a lot of leveraging of relationships. You know, can you introduce me to this person? Can you host this? Can you call these people? Can you have them there, you know, to meet me? And, and I just, that's not why those kinds of things aren't why I got into public office to, to, to be that kind of person to, to go through that grind day in and day out and feeling like you're not really making the best use of your time if you're going to be involved in, in public office. Ballpark, what does it cost to run for a statewide office? So it's going to kind of vary around the state because obviously like the, you know, the main focus and the, the one that is most visible for people is the governor's race. And so, I mean, you're looking at, at a million plus. And, and, and you guys being right there next to, to Virginia and, and next to Maryland, campaigns are a lot less expensive in West Virginia than they are in those states. And so if you're look, you're probably looking at over a million, million and a half approximately. I'm just ballparking it. For governor, it might be close to two million this year if, if someone can raise that much money. And then, as you go down the, the the ballot, attorney general's race, maybe it takes you know five, six, seven hundred thousand uh, dollars is what you know we were looking uh, to to do in order to to run that campaign. And then it just I, I think that it it goes down as you work down the ballot. Someone's running for state auditor, secretary of state. Um, state treasurer, but it still is it's expensive. And, and you know, West Virginia isn't a big state. The you know, the people who are involved in, in campaigns who like to get involved and, and make contributions in West Virginia, it's a, it's a small pool. And so more often than not, a, a candidate is looking outside of the state of West Virginia to want to invest in their campaign here. Ryan, knowing what you know, does West Virginia need any further election reform? I don't really know what reforms would take place to, at least from my perspective of why I decided to, to no longer pursue the AG campaign. I don't really know what would change or what would need to be changed that I would have said, oh, well, I will stay in the race or I'll continue on. Um, I think, you know, we just always need to make sure that, that people here in West Virginia have access to voting, have the, the ability to vote, whether that be, through early voting or, or on election day itself, I think that's the biggest thing, that we just always need to ensure that, that everybody here who, who legally can vote has the ability to, should they choose to do so. Thanks so much for your time this morning, Ryan. We always very much appreciate it. Any final, uh, any gentlemen, final thoughts? Gentlemen, always a pleasure. Thank you very much. Very good. Have a great day. You too. Senator Ryan Weld, no longer candidate for attorney general, but would appear to me, Bill, to be the front runner for judiciary chair with uh, Senator Trump running for judge. I would think so. He's, for justice. Yeah, he's held in high regard, at least from all reports I have. He's a very rational, very dependable individual.